Greetings and blessings. Our Lenten shared time for examination, reflection, and prayer is dwindling. With Palm Sunday near and Easter on the horizon, we anticipate the lows and the highs of the death and resurrection of a loving God. The miraculous redemption delivered by Christ Jesus for any and all committed to follow him and his path. And so we connect through this broadcast, joined together in the desert of Linton Journey, to embrace chances to remove obstacles and find stronger ways to glow closer to God. We offer praise and heartfelt pleas from our hearts to your heavenly altar as we pray. Please help the family impacted by the near campus car wreck last week. For our country and those elected and enlisted to protect it. Help my friend make choices less rooted in hurt, pride, and frustration. Heal all families impacted by the death of a loved one. Help my family as we deal with the unexpected loss of our sister. Help my roommate be less angry. Please grant health and safety to my friends and family as they travel in for Easter. For all those impacted by the war in Ukraine, especially at Easter time. Jesus, help me find patience and calm in my life. God, help my nephew as he drives cross country and begins a new chapter in his life. For my family and any others currently battling cancer. God, give hope to the frail, the elderly, and those who are alone, especially during the holiday. Help me forgive and show mercy more often and better. For my brother as he deals with his back problems. God, help me to be open to your plan and not get distracted from your will. For a friend struggling with substance abuse and depression. Thank you for the many blessings you give me. May Easter be a time for rekindled faith and family across the whole world. Heavenly Father, hear these shared prayers and those intentions known only in the depths of our hearts. The assurance of your care for us is beyond all measure and all telling. Be with us in this time of ponder and reflection and afford to us a deeper awareness of your compassion, your compassion for all, as you fuel our individual quests to better serve the needs of your plan. We ask for your pardon, your passion, and your peace, now and forever. Amen. Greetings and welcome. We are broadcasting here from the Martin Meditation Chapel here on the campus of the Ottawa, Kansas campus. And um, I'm in my finery, the things that I have that best represent the spirit campus colors. And that is because this is the week for Norwood Jones Convocation here on the campus campus. You, in Arizona, you've already had it. And Wisconsin, you just get to see the video. We don't have one there for you this year. But the interesting piece about that is this is always a time for me to enjoy getting to hear a speaker and sometimes getting to see a student that I knew as a student come back as a professional who's brilliant and speaks on things. And this year in Kansas is one of those times. Uh, the person that is here, Kevin Honeycutt, is a person that when he was a student I thought was a brilliant actor and just an amazing guy. And he's gone on to do great things and now is coming back to share his wisdom. So I'm wearing my finery um, and feeling a little older and worse for the wear, but awfully pleased and proud of him and of his presence here on campus. So with that said, I, I told you guys last week I was struggling a bit with my own charges and I felt pretty good about some of the things that I explained and the questions that I got both were around things I felt pretty good in how I explained. <laughs> so it was humbling and good for me. One said, it's hard for me to tell the difference between value and worth. And I get that. And the other was, was talking about how do you know the impact you make in your name or in God's? Both of those are probably just what I needed to hear for my own ponder and reflection, for my own charge. So uh, one of the other interesting things about this week is Keith, my assistant, is off being trained with a bunch of management people from the city. And so he's gone this week. 
and Keith and I and and Sean, who's my GA, and some other people, we work through a campus ministries address. Many of you who've emailed me go through that address. And we have two windows to get through. It's campus ministries and the chaplain's um, corner, which is located on the website. As always, that's how you get your prayer requests or how you can ask a question of me. But Campus Ministries is run by different people. So when I respond to a Campus Ministry email, it says, on behalf of Campus Ministries, then it has my name, and so on. So I was thinking about that in thinking about that concept of authority. You know, when do I know that I'm doing something out, out of my intentions or for God's? I do think differently, and I think so does Keith and so does Ashan, when we are speaking for Campus Ministries. I, I try to be more broad. I try to be less strident. I try to be more open to things that I hadn't thought about as me. Because campus ministries is a broader table, frankly. If people email campus ministries, they don't necessarily want to get to me unless they say they want to talk to the chaplain. As, as some of you know, campus ministries sometimes is request for use of the food bank or the clothing bank. Request for financial assistance if you're struggling this month and paying a bill. And we have a wonderful student committee that helps us figure out how we can spend money that's donated by our alums to help our students. Campus Ministries then has both more authority and less judgment to wield. Campus Ministries then, in my mind, in that sort of influence and concerned issue, is speaking for the body of Christ, not just for the body part. And I think that that's some of the issue on authority. When, when you talk about the scriptural issues that says, if the eye says, or if the hand says, and that's both the judgment side of body parts, and when Jesus says, if, if the right hand offends, cut it off and throw it in the fire, the judgment part, that doesn't necessarily judge the body. Certainly, if we think about people that have physical disabilities, there's people that do amazing and wondrous things that have some real damage to their body for whatever reason. And it's their spirit, their will, and their skill that allows them to do what they need to do, what they want to do, what they're called to do. And that could be missing a digit or missing an arm. I've worked with a lot of veterans in my life, especially helping out at the VA, and you'd be amazed at what people can do who have been horribly injured, using, sometimes using prosthetics and sometimes just using ways to make things happen when it's important to them and important to the world. In those times then where we really have a task to do or a mission to complete, where we represent all body parts of Christ, those are the times where the authority truly and clearly comes from God. And where we need to make sure that we don't confuse people. We need to make sure that we say the authority clearly comes from God. They don't want to know our opinion in that case. Now, if someone asks your opinion, you have every right to tell them. You just need to present it as your opinions, not God's. In that area, then, I think it's clear, although it's tempting sometimes, because we get a lot more authority if we say God says... But it's also clear, I think, when we're doing that to get people to listen to our point and not necessarily to listen to God. The other one was a little more difficult because it really was an issue that says in that realm of of worth and of value, how do you judge the two? So I should not admit this, but I really did find something that I'm sort of proud of. And I think, although it's possible I read it somewhere, that it's my own invention. I prayed a lot on that. And what I came up with was this. It's the two by four. Here is the issue on the two by four. What have I done to someone? What has someone done to me? What have I done to God? What was done by me? What was done by that person? What was done by God? What was done for me? What was done for that person? What was done for God? The two by four then was my way of trying to really reflect on when are those things intentional and when did I just miss it? 
you know, I, I had an experience several times with a friend who listened to music that I really did not care for. I really have turned into sort of that old guy that says, oh my gosh, that's just noise. But I listened as patiently and as open-mindedly as I could because it was sort of this mixture of rap and something else, which he tried to explain to me. It was music that my nephew also knows. He was thrilled that I knew some of these titles. And each time, I just thought, this is making my head hurt. But I wanted to give it as a love gift, and I really wanted to be open to hear what shaped relaxation and statement and what helped this person find purpose in music because music has always been powerful for me and I have to tell you it was pretty much noise for me now that's a judgment but in my mind I was doing that truly I was enduring it because that person was worth it to me to give it a shot I was doing it for them well, guess what I got for a Christmas present? Now, some strange, because I'm such a technophobe, downloadable thing that allowed me to have a ringtone on my cell phone that was a small sampling of that noise. Because apparently I had said about that one particular song, oh, that's nice. I did not mean to be disingenuous. It was nicer than the others. I was doing that as a love gift for a friend, someone I've known for a very long time, since right after I got out of college, who's much more progressive, at least in music, than I am. That presents a real quandary, because I don't want that as a ringtone. It would put me over the edge. I could try then to turn it on as a ringtone if I was smart enough to do it on my phone when my friend was about, so they could hear it ringing and think, aha, how much of that then is truth in the realm of what does truth mean? You don't necessarily need to boast or brag and say, look what I've done for you. But it's okay to admit that sometimes we do things for people that we can just barely tolerate. In that realm of two before, it was important for me then to understand that that, if you remember... If you listened a couple of weeks ago when I was having my own crisis with my charge, was sort of where I am. I'm needing to do things for God that are hard for me to tolerate. I'm needing to tolerate people for God that are hard for me to deal with. I, I'm needing to deal with people for God that I would rather avoid I'm needing to not avoid people for God that I would like to tell off. That is where I am. I would like to tell them to turn down their music. I would like to tell them to turn down their rhetoric because it gets in my way of God. But it gets in my way of God not theirs. In that belief that God sets a broad table, so much of what I can do is to do all those things for God. I'm trying. It's like eating food when your parents make something you don't like and say someday you'll like it. It's like eating something for a friend or a partner that they like so much that you don't. My poor sweet late wife hated fish. She hated fish, and I love fish. She hated seafood. She hated freshwater fish. The kids mixed feelings on freshwater, but they love seafood. I love shrimp. I love lobster. I love. Linda really didn't. The compromise we had through the years, and she did take bites when we were dating, was that we didn't cook a lot of smelly fish in the house but we could all eat together. We didn't cook a lot of smelly fish in the house because it really did make her sick to her stomach. She wasn't faking it. It made her a bit irpy to smell a bunch of fish. I love that smell. 
That's not too different than loving noise that's not music, in my mind. That's not too different than abiding by opinions that offend. As we sit at the large table set by Christ, we have to deal with it if we truly are Christians. Today in Scripture, you'll hear one of my, I think, well, two Scriptures. One that scared, scared me horribly when I was a kid about dem bones, dem bones, the bones, and the, the prophecy of the bones coming together and the soul being, okay, that was creepy. I remember as a kid going, yikes. And the one that talks about, and Jesus wept. And I remember as a kid going, whoa, Jesus wept. Both of these to me have been good because like our visitor for Norwood Jones, it's a blast from the past. It reminds me why, as a younger version of me, and as a me trying to grow childlike, bringing that childlike faith and wonder to the, the teachings shared by God, to the food that I don't like but I witness somewhere else, to the dialogue and to the music by other people who claim to be brethren to me is something I must continually work to keep open in my heart and in my mind if I truly want to be a welcoming body part of Christ. Let's listen to scripture and we'll see where that leaves our charge. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me prophecy to the breath of prophecy mortal and say to the breath thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet a vast multitude. And then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves, and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. In Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love Bye. 
Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. But they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. <clears throat> When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she would said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus, who had not yet, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her, because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face wrapped in a cloth, Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. As you've probably noticed, our scripture passages are getting longer. We're hearing more divine word, less of my talk. And part of that because we're really close, in fact, to being done with Lent. We've got Palm Sunday. <laughs> it's coming up. <laughs> We've got Easter. And in between, we have Tritium and, and all the sort of shock, awe, and, and sorrow that comes with that. So this is really a time where we are on our path back from the heart of the desert. And Scripture is what we need to hear to help us continue to plot and plan and ponder where our steps are as we emerge from the desert through Easter 
and go out to be a welcoming member of God's ambassadorship. So, I think that that really puts us to the tail end of the charge we're on. We have one more week to move from creed to credo. Me and where I fit with the faith. We talked last week about some of my ponders on that, trying to to leave things better than I found them, those kind of things, trying to have some personal statements, even, even if I don't like the situation, on how to make it better. This week, I gave you my magic two by four before we heard scripture, trying to really be mindful with who I impact, who I have done things to, who would say I've done things for and so on, and vice versa who has done things to me, for me, what has been done by me that impacts others. The last part then, as I define my credo, is to really say, and this I think will be both hard and easy, where are those lines where I am forced to leave my gift at the altar and make peace with my brother? Where, because I don't like their music, or their diatribe, or their cologne, or their food, where have I offended them enough to feel righteous? And when does that separate me from my ability to lovingly and humbly come before God? When do I need to apologize for what I have done or what I have failed to do? Those aren't exactly my own Ten Commandments, and certainly if it violates one of the big ten, that's sort of clear. Certainly if it violates Jesus' big commandments, the great commandments, that's clear. But where are those lines where I just cause people hurt? And if I'm in doubt where I cause them hurt and am pleased about it, well, I told him, I showed her. And if I still feel that way, how would it remotely be possible to gladly give God a gift when I'm feeling that smug, superior, and righteous. It is easier, I often find, to to define what those things are before they happen to you. So my intent is to try to see where the pitfalls, slings, and arrows may be so I do not encounter them at a time, as I told you earlier, where sometimes I snap to a point where I want to tell people how I feel instead of speaking as campus ministries or the body of Christ. My charge then, your charge, is to find out those things that separate our gifts from God, to have them listed or mentally noted, and to immediately be able to do triage if we find that we've crossed those lines. And with that, we'll be ready to go in to the agony and the majesty that is Tritium. As always, I'm glad you're on the journey with me. It's nice not to be alone, even if you're conjoined with people that you may never see. There's just a feeling that lets you know that there's other body parts with you as we march boldly forward to touch the face of God. Let's close in prayer then. God, we live in times where it's really hard not to feel more human and less a body part of you. There is so much noise and division. There's so much frustration. We have all these storms and tornadoes and things. It's really easy just to think we can cry out and say, Master, save us, we're drowning. Somewhere in all this, like wonderful students that turn into ambassadors and come back to lead, you have called us to be the ones that help and heal and rescue. The ones that show your love, that clothe your naked, that feed your hungry. Truly, 
the ones to be your hands and feet and heart in action. But God, it's still really hard in the din of the world to want to help people that don't seem to want to be helped or that don't appreciate what we do or that feel we should help them more. Help us then to understand how we can emulate the selflessness that you show us through your suffering, through your death, through your resurrection. Help us to understand those that we do things to, things that would say we've done things, either did or didn't, that impacted them. Help those things be positive reflections of you. Help us to look at things, people, nouns, that we would say have done by, was done for, and help us to make sure that each time we think of those, we say that they reflected your will, your plan, and your compassion. And finally, help us to acknowledge and admit the things that say we should be in time out until we make peace with our brother. To look at the things that because of the inflammation they give us would separate us from being able to come to you with a clean heart and help us truly admit it, wash them off, and let them go. Apologize to those that we've hurt and come back empty and clean so that you can fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask that as we look at the glimmer of the Easter promise and know that we want it to inhabit us and to take us past and into building your kingdom, now and forever. Amen. On Jordan's bank the Baptist cry announces that the Lord is nigh. Awake and knock and pour ye brings glad tidings of the King of kings. Then cleansed be every Christian breast and furnished for so great a guest. Oh, let us each our hearts prepare for Christ to come and enter there. For thou art our salvation, Lord, and refuge and our great reward. Once more upon thy people shine and fill the world with love divine. All praise, eternal Son, to thee, whose advent set thy people free, whom with the Father we adore, and Holy Ghost forevermore.